In Glasgow on 19th July 1955, an audacious bank robbery took place. On Paisley Road West, near Ibrox Stadium, the home of Glasgow Rangers Football Club, there once stood a branch of the British Linen Bank. At 9.30 that summer morning, at the beginning of the Glasgow Fair fortnight, the bank's security van pulled up, as it did every Tuesday morning, carrying close to £44,000, almost a million pounds in today's money. It was the second stop of the day. The driver jumped out, but left his keys in the ignition, something he always did, and opened the back doors of the red van. Little did he know that every move was being closely watched by four men, standing opposite the bank. They were about to pull off the biggest bank heist the city had ever seen. They were wearing brown dust coats and looked just like tradesmen, waiting to start work. As the driver and Charles McNeil, one of the guards, went into the bank, one guard was left inside the open van. At that moment, one of the men in the dust coats slapped the palm of his hands with a rolled-up newspaper, a signal that now was the time the job would take place. All four walked across the quieter-than-usual road. Then two of them leapt into the back of the van, seized the guard, Lindsay Curry, coshed him over the head, tied him up, gagged him, and covered his eyes in tape. Two others jumped in the front of the van, and the squeal of tyres was heard as it sped off down Paisley Road West, the open doors flapping behind it and cash spilling out onto the street. It had taken just seconds. The security guard in the bank and the driver, 24-year-old Gilbert Tate, rushed out just in time to see the van turn into Gower Street. The security driver commandeered a passing truck to try and follow it, but it was too slow, and he lost them. Fifteen minutes later, an elderly woman, Elizabeth Duncan, was walking past an abandoned house at 7 Drumbreck Road, less than a mile from the scene of the heist, and heard muffled cries coming from the driveway. When she reached it, she saw a van with a pair of legs hanging out of it. It was the security guard, blindfolded, tied up and bleeding, but the gag had been removed. There were also some money bags full of coins that had been left, presumably too bulky and heavy to transport, and not worth a great deal. The police were called immediately. When they arrived, they assessed the scene. The empty house with its concealed driveway, thanks to trees and shrubbery, led them to believe the gang must have concealed a car in its grounds and did a vehicle swap. They also guessed the robbers must have had a 15-minute head start, but they were able to get a description from a local gardener. It was a black saloon car, so dozens of police cars were sent out to lock down the area. Meanwhile, the injured Curry was taken to Victoria Infirmary, where he was treated for his head injury and shock. He was released a short time afterwards, but told to have ten days bed rest. Glasgow by this point had seen its fair share of bank jobs, but nothing of this scale had been attempted before. It had been a professional heist, well planned, and well executed. Another issue was the British linen bank notes, as they were of small denomination, ten shillings, one pound and five pounds, so if used would have been very difficult to trace. Some of the larger notes had had their serial numbers logged, but this only accounted for around a thousand pounds. The police thought someone, somewhere, must have known something, but there was no chatter from Glasgow's underground informants. Either they were staying tight-lipped, or the robbers hadn't come from Glasgow, or perhaps even Scotland. 
The investigation was headed up by Glasgow CID's Chief Detective Superintendent, Gilbert Micklewick, along with Detective Inspector Robert Kerr and Chief Detective Inspector James McCauley. One of the clues the police worked with was the rope that had bound Curry. It was relatively new, so they asked around Glasgow shops, but it was to no avail. A black saloon car, a Rover 60, was soon discovered in Perth. It had been parked in the city since 20th July, the day after the robbery. It had false number plates and had been stolen in London two months earlier. Fingerprints had been left behind in the car. But police also had a new tool at their disposal, and that was television. There were five million TV sets in the UK, most in London. For the first time, a nationwide TV appeal was made. The robbers had made a critical mistake. The brown dust coats had been left behind in the van when it was abandoned, and one of these dust coats was shown on the TV appeal. It had the initials FB written in the collar, and police hoped someone would recognise it. And someone did. An automobile association patrolman, Frank Buckingham, recognised it as his coat, as he'd written his initials in it, but had lent it to an associate, also from London. Police got a name and an address, and made their first arrest, but not in England, but Ireland. He was John Charles Lappin, who was arrested at the Dunlagare Hotel in Dublin. Another five arrests followed. These were John Blundell, John Bryden, Charles McGuinness, Cornelius O'Donnell and William White Thompson. The trial got underway on 9th January 1956 at the High Court in Glasgow, with all those involved pleading not guilty. William Donald Patrick, Lord Patrick, oversaw the proceedings. One of the witnesses was 10-year-old Jean Pandalus. She and her mother May and her aunt Mina Slater had been passing a decorator's shop when the robbery took place. All three had seen the men standing close to the bank. Then she saw the security guards enter the bank before the robbers struck and sped off in the van. The Rob Roy Roadhouse near Aberfoyle had been used as a base by the gang, both before and after the robbery. Witnesses from here had come forward with vital information and testified in court. One guest reported seeing two men with bundles of cash, who she identified as George Gray, the mastermind of the whole affair, and Blundell, and a housekeeper also recognised Gray. The group had left the roadhouse in a Riley and a Rover, but a local mechanic testified that the Riley had been repaired in his garage. In all, over a hundred witnesses testified during the trial. Three of the men were found guilty, 45-year-old Blundell, 56-year-old Lappin and 43-year-old McGuinness, followed later by George Gray, nicknamed the monocled major, who was the man accused of hitting Tate over the head with the cosh in September 1957. He'd been unable to attend the Glasgow trial as he was by that time serving a seven-year sentence for robbery in Surrey. The charges against the others were not proven. Lappin was sentenced to eight years in prison, while McGuinness and Blundell were sentenced to six years each. Around £6,000 from the house was recovered, but the rest of it was never accounted for. What happened to it remains a mystery to this day.